Good morning. This uh, subject of today's lecture is options. Uh, and uh, I want to, I think maybe I better first define what an option is uh, before I move to uh, just saying anything about them. Because some of you may not have encountered them, because they're not part of everyday life for most people. Uh, although they are in a sense. <laughs> I'll get back to that. Let me just define terms here. Um, so, the, I should turn the light on here. I don't know where the switch is. Well, uh, I will just uh, make do. So, there's two kinds of options. There's a call and a put. Okay, a call option is an option to buy something at a specified price, uh, and the price is called the exercise price or strike price. Those are synonyms. And a put option is the right to sell something uh, at the uh, specified exercise price. Uh, and it, um, it has uh, another, another uh, term that has to be specified, uh, and that's the uh, exercise date. Okay. Options go back uh, thousands of years. Uh, it must have happened before we have any recorded records. If you want to buy something, you're thinking of buying something from someone, um, but you don't want to put up the money today, you go to some lawyer uh, and say, write up a contract. I want, to buy, I want to buy an option to buy this thing. So, for example, if you are thinking of building a building on land that uh, is owned now by a farmer, uh, but you're not ready to do it, you may be thinking about it. Uh, you can go to the farmer and say, I'd like to buy that corner of that acre there. Uh, I'd like to have the right to buy it. I'll pay you now for the right. And you get a lawyer and you write up a contract. And that's, that's an option. You have an option to buy uh, at the exercise price until the exercise date. Uh, now, in modern terminology, we have two kinds. Uh, American and European. Uh, and the, uh, the, it doesn't refer to geography, those two terms. The, uh, the terms refer instead to um, when you can exercise. So, the American option is better than the European option for the buyer, because the American option can be exercised at any time until the exercise date, whereas a European option can be exercised only on the exercise date. But you see, the American option has to be better, uh, or not worse than, I don't know if it's strictly better, but not worse than a European option, because you have more options. Uh, so, uh, I think we've defined what they are. Do you underst understand well enough what they are? They, uh, they occur naturally in, in life. I, I remember um, uh, Avinash Dixit was writing about options, and he said, well, when you're dating someone and you know the person will marry you, you have an option <laughs> which you can exercise at any time by agreeing to marry. Um, now, w one, one of the theorems in option theory is, is you usually don't want to exercise a call option early. Um, and so, uh, Dixit was saying, well, maybe that, uh, that's why a lot of people have trouble getting married. <laughs> they don't want to exercise their option early. What we'll see is that options have option value. They give you a choice. And so, there's something that when you exercise an option, that means when you actually buy the thing 
or in the case of a put, sell the thing, then you're losing the choice. So you've given up something. Uh, of course, you have to also exercise uh, eventually if things are going to, to make sense. Usually, when we talk about options, we're talking now about options to buy a share of stock or a hundred shares of stock. Uh, and that's the usual example, but they occur all over the place. L let, me, let me mention uh, some other examples uh, of options. The, the, st the usual story is the stock option. You go to your broker and you say, I'd like to buy an option to buy a hundred shares of Microsoft. I don't want to buy Microsoft, I want to buy an option to buy Microsoft. Which happens to be cheaper, by the way, usually. Usually, you know, uh, uh, costs more money to actually buy the thing than to buy the right to buy the thing at another price. We'll get back to that. But in a sense, let's think about this. Stocks themselves are options, in a sense, because uh, with a zero exercise price. Maybe I'll have to get back and explain that. But what I mean is, um, yeah, let, let, me, let me get back and uh, explain that in a minute. Um, but let me go ahead to the other examples. Mortgages, an ordinary home mortgage, has an option characteristic to it, in the sense that if, you don't, if the price of your home drops a lot, and, uh, you can just walk away from the mortgage and say, I, I, I'm, out of, I'm out of here. It's like not exercising an option. It's, an, it's analogous. Uh, or I can choose to prepay a mortgage early. And that's like exercising an option. So option pricing gets into all sorts of things. Um, OK, so I thought, that I, it, 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 I thought I should say something about the purposes of options before I move on to try to discuss what their uh, properties and pricing are, which is the main subject of this lecture. Uh, the, I, I can give a, 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 a two different justifications for options. Why do we have options? Uh, you, it, some people cynically think that options are just gambling vehicles. <laughs> it's another way to gamble. You can go to the casino, uh, you can play poker, or you can buy options. Uh, well, I think for some people that's just what it is. They're, they're volatile, risky advancements that can make you a lot of money. But I think they have a, a basic purpose. And so, uh, or purposes. First of all, theoretical. If we're trying to design the ideal financial system, uh, what would we do? Um, and there, the, I think back, some people th thought of ideal economic systems without reference to finance. Like Karl Marx, I come back to him, the great communist, <laughs> thought that we would have an ideal communist state and there'd be no financial markets. Uh, when they actually tried it and they tried to do it, I think they gradually realized that not having any financial markets uh, makes our entrepreneurship, our management of enterprises kind of blind. We can't see where we're going because there's no prices. We don't know what anything is worth. Um, there was an old joke that the, the communist countries survived only because they had prices from capitalist countries to rely on. Otherwise, they don't know anything uh, about values or profits, right? You, uh, so we need prices. Uh, and I just trace the, many people have written about this. Uh, but I mentioned in 1964, Kenneth Arrow, who is an economic theorist, wrote a classic paper in which he argued that we don't, unless we have prices for all states of nature, there is a sense in which the economic system is inefficient. You really need the price of everything 
including the, 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 pr the price of some possibility. And in a sense, that's what options are giving you, uh, or the, the existence of options are giving you. Uh, so, um, Stephen Ross, uh, who used to teach here at Yale, a friend of mine, uh, lives here in New Haven uh, in 1976 in the Quarterly Journal of Economics. Wrote a classic paper about options, showing that in a sense they complete the state space. They, they create prices for everything that, uh, that affects decision making. So I'm not going to get into the technicalities of the paper, but I wanted to start with a theoretical justification for options so that you'll see why we're doing this. I don't want this to come across as a lecture how you can gamble in the options market. This is about making things work right for the economic system, improving human welfare. Um, but it seems unintu you know, a lot of people don't get that. That's why Karl Marx was so successful. It seems too abstract. What does this options market do for us? It does, um, but let me just go back to the example I started out with. You're, you're a, a construction firm and you're thinking of building something, a new supermarket, right, where people can buy their food. And you note that there's, an, there's a, a um, pair of expressways crossing somewhere and you think that's the perfect place to build a mega supermarket because everyone can get there by car and uh, there's a lot of land, I can build a big parking lot. Perfect. But before you think further, you go to buy an option on the land, right? So you, you knock on the door at the farmhouse and there's a farmer with all these acres and you say, I'm thinking of building a, a mega supermarket here. I'd like to buy an option on your farm. You learn something at that moment. You might learn that the farmer says, I've already sold an option, so you, I can't do it. Uh, you could try to talk to the person I sold it to and see if you can buy it from him. But, uh, I, or the farmer might say, I've had three other offers and I'm raising my price to some, you know, millions of millions of dollars. And then you have a second thoughts about doing it. You see what I'm saying? That the price discovery is in there. It's making things happen differently. You're learning something. The farmer is learning something. <laughs> you are learning something from the options market and ultimately, it decides where that supermarket will go. So th that's, the, that's the theoretical purpose of options. Uh, but I wanted to talk also about a behavioral. This uh, purpose of options, or um, it gets a little fuzzier about the actual benefits of options from. Uh, uh, from this standpoint, the, uh, uh, the behavioral theory of options says that well, it's very it as very many different aspects of human behavior tie into options, but um, uh, I, I would say it has something to do with attention anomalies and salience. Psychologists talk about this, that people make mistakes very commonly in what they pay attention to, what strikes their fancy or their imagination. Salience is something psychologists also talk about, that certain kinds of events, or maybe it's similar to salient. Salient events are events that tend to attract attention, tend to be remembered. Uh, now, when you think of options, a lot of options are what are called incentive options, okay? Uh, and when you get your first job, you may discover this. They'll give you options to buy shares in the company you work for. Why do they do that? I think it's because of certain human behavioral traits that uh, I, I mentioned here, your attention and your salience. but. It's not necessarily very expensive for a company to give you options to buy shares in the company, but it gives you, it puts you in a situation where you start to pay attention to the value of the company. It becomes salient for you 
and you start hoping that the price of the company will go up because you have options to buy it at a strike price. You hope that the company's price per share goes above your strike price because then your options are worth something. They're in the money. So it may change your motivation and your morale at work or a sense of identity with the company. All these sorts of things figure in. Um, and so that's why we have uh, incentive options. Uh, they can also give you peace of mind. Uh, and uh, insurance is actually related to options in the sense that uh, when you buy insurance on your house, it's like buying a put option on your house. Although it may be not directly connected to the home's value, but right? When you buy an insurance policy on your house and the house burns down, you collect on the insurance policy. Uh, well, the price of your house fell to zero. If you had bought a put option on the house, it would do the same thing, right? You, you would have an uh, option to sell it at a high price, uh, something that's now worthless. So, uh, an, uh, insurance is like options. And insurance gives you peace of mind. And uh, so, people think in certain repetitive patterns, and one of them is that I would like to not worry about something. So, I can get peace of mind by not, if I have a put option on something that I might otherwise worry about. All right, I, I, maybe that's enough of an introduction, uh, but I've given you both theoretical reasons for options and behavioral reasons. I, I think of them as basically inevitable. Uh, you may have people advising you not to bother with options markets, and that might be right for you in a sense, but I think that they're always going to be with us. And so, it's something that we have to understand. So, uh, let me, uh, I have a newspaper clipping that I took. Uh, I cut it out. I've been teaching this course for over 20 years, so uh, sometimes I don't update my newspaper clippings. Uh, I have a, a newspaper clipping from the options page that I made in 2002. Okay, so that's nine years ago. But I can't update it anymore because newspapers don't print option prices anymore. So I could go on some electronic trade account and get an updated option page. But why don't we just stick with uh, the Wall Street Journal? So this is a clipping from the Wall Street Journal, uh, April 2002, when they used to have an options page. Okay. And uh, I just picked uh, America Online, uh, just as, uh, I don't know why, it was an interesting company. Do you remember America Online? It web presence. It used to be bigger than it is now. Um, and actually, in 2000, America Online merged with uh, Time Warner. Okay. And so, we actually have two different uh, rows corresponding. Up there, well, forget Ace Limited. The, the second row says AOW, AOL.TW. That's America Online Time Warner, the merged company. Uh, and then below that, they have America Online itself. Uh, these were options that were issued before the merger, and uh, they apparently are being exercised. Uh, in terms of the same AOL Time Warner stock. AOL, by the way, was spun off by Time Warner last year, so they, they had a divorce. They were married in 2000, they were divorced in 2010. So you can get back to AOL options uh, without uh, now. But uh, so anyway, uh, under every, uh, it shows the price of the share at $21.85 a share. So, you can take any of these rows, um, and uh, it shows you, for various strike prices, what, uh, what the options prices are. So, um, let's, let's go to the top row. A strike price of 20, uh, expiring in May of, um, of uh, 
2002, which is like one month into the future. Remember, it's April 2002 right now. The, uh, the volume is the number of options that were traded yesterday, and the $2.55 up there is the price of a call option. Uh, the, the last price, the last price, the last option to be traded yesterday. This is the morning paper. It's reporting on yesterday morning's prices. Uh, and then there's put options traded. A lot more puts were traded on that day. There were 2,000 put options traded uh, on that day in April 2002. And the last price of the put option was 85 cents. So you, you see what the. So for 85 cents, you could buy the right to sell a share of AOL Time Warner at $20. Okay. And similarly, you could buy the right to buy it at $20 for $2.55. So these are different strike prices and different exercise dates. Here's an, this one is, um, which one we can pick? This one, I can reach it, is to buy, at, at, well, if it's a call, $25 strike price. Cost you 45 cents to buy that. But if you want to buy a put, it costs you $3.60. We want to try to understand these prices. Okay, that's the purpose here. Uh, so, uh, uh, let me say one thing more before I get into that. This is presented for the potential buyer. Okay, these are options prices. There's also the seller of the option, or called the writer of the option. I gave you an example I, uh, before when I talked about the farmer and you thinking of building a supermarket. So you are the buyer of the option, and the farmer is the writer of the option. Uh, the, the farmer is writing the option to you. You could also consider buying an option from someone else who's not even the farmer, right? It could be some speculator. You don't have to go to the farmer. You could go to somebody else and say, I'd like to buy an option on that farm over there. And someone say, sure, I'll sell you an option on it. And then I'm good for it. That means I have to go and buy it at whatever price from the farmer. Maybe that's not such a good idea. He might sense my urgency to buy it. And, but if it's a stock, someone can write an option who doesn't even own the stock. And so that's called a naked seller of an option. Okay. Neither the buyer nor the seller ever have to trade in the stock. This is a market by itself. You know, you could buy an option and then you could sell it before as an option without ever exercising it. Uh, and uh, so the writer could write an option and then uh, buy, a, buy an option to cancel it out later and, and then essentially get out of that contract. So the option becomes a market of its own where prices of options start to look like an independent market. And this is called a, a derivatives market because there's a, uh, this is a, there's an underlying stock price, uh, but this is a derivative of the stock price. Uh, they were first traded, the, uh, the first options exchange was the Chicago Board Options Exchange which came in in 1973. Before that, the options were traded, but they were traded through brokers, and they didn't have the same presence. They, you, know, you didn't see all of these options prices in newspapers. It's when they opened the market for options uh, that uh, the options trading became a big thing. So options markets are relatively new. I mean, if you consider 73 new, you, you weren't born then, but. It's not really that long ago. Uh, since then, there are many more options exchanges, uh, but um, CBOE is the first one. They're now all over the world, uh, and we also have uh, options on futures, and so futures exchanges now routinely trade options on their futures contracts. Uh, so that's a derivative on a derivative, but uh, it, it, it's done. Uh, okay, 
So let me uh, draw a simple picture of option pricing. So uh, this is um, the stock price. Uh, and this is the option price. Okay. And I'm going to mark here the exercise price. Uh, then the um, let's look at the exercise date, the last day. Okay, the option uh, you know uh, is about to expire, and this is your last chance to buy the stock. Then it doesn't matter on that day whether it's an American or European option; they're both the same on the last day. What is the price of the option as a function of the stock price? Well, if the stock price is less than the exercise price, the option is worthless, right? It's, uh, it will not be exercised. You won't exercise an option to buy it for more than you could just buy it on the market, right? I guess you call. I'm, I'm, did I not say call? Yes. I'll put it up here. We're talking about call options. Uh, thank you. Uh, but if it's above the exercise price, um, it, this is a 45 degree angle that's in line with the slope of one. The option price rises with the stock price. In fact, it just equals the stock price minus the exercise price, right? So uh, this region we say is out of the money. The option is out of the money uh, when its price is for a call is less than the exercise price. Here it's in the money. Uh, I'll put it up here, in the money. And then on the exercise date, it will always equal the stock price minus the exercise price. So it's very simple. Now, uh, wh one confusion that's often made, I gave the example of building a shopping center or a, a supermarket on a farm. Now, someone might think that you buy an option on it so that you can think about it and make up your mind later. Well, in a sense, you could do that. But, what I'm s but the thing is, you will exercise the option whether or not you build the shopping mall or the, sh or the supermarket if it's in the money, right? Suppose the farmer, suppose you've changed your mind and I don't want to build a supermarket. But I'm sitting on an option that I bought to buy his land for a price which is less than the market price for it. Of course I'll buy it. So you're going to buy it whether you build the shopping center or not. Uh, you always exercise the option if it's in the money on the last day. That's an assumption. I mean, you could not, I suppose, if you like the farmer and you want to be a nice guy. <laughs> I don't know. But usually, it's, it's all about what it is is a nonlinear relation between the stock price and the derivative. So the derivative is a broken straight line uh, function of the stock price. Whereas all the portfolios we construct are linear. They're, they're straight lines. They don't have a break in them. So it's creating, the option creates a break in the stock, in the, uh, uh, and this is why Ross emphasized that options price something very different. It's not priced in the regular, no portfolio shows you uh, this broken straight line relation. Now I wanted to then talk about a put. What is a put? Uh, let me erase where it says in and out of the money, but I'll show it. Uh, I'll do this with a dashed line so that you'll see uh, which one is. I'm leaving the call line up. With a put, a put is out of the money. Up here, if I can't really show it too well, uh, if the stock price is above the exercise price, because you're selling now, and it's in the money if the stock price is less than the exercise price. I didn't draw that very well, but that's supposed to be a 45 degree line. That's 45 degree angle. Has a slope of minus one, right? So, um, on the exercise date. Now, it's interesting that th there's a pretty simple pattern here between puts and calls. Um, what if I buy one call and I short one 
put. All right? or, or write a put. Same thing as writing a put and sharding a put are the same thing. All right? What does that portfolio look like? Well, if I put that portfolio together, if, I, if I'm, okay, I want to ha have a call plus one call minus one put. All right? Well, my portfolio relation to the stock price is going to look like that, right? It's just going to be a straight line. So my portfolio is equal, the value of my portfolio is equal to the stock price minus the exercise price. Simple as that. And my portfolio uh, can be negative now, because I've, I've shorted something, I can have a negative portfolio value. Uh, so do you, that's very simple, <laughs> you can see that? Uh, this li leads us to the put-call parity uh, e equation. Well, if, if, a, if a put minus a call is the same thing as the stock minus the exercise price, then th the prices should add up too, right? Uh, so put call parity. There's different ways of writing this, and uh, but it, it says that the um, uh, the stock price equals. Let me see. The stock price price equals the call price minus put price plus exercise price on the last day, on the exercise day, right? It's simple. This is put call parity on the exercise day. Um, now let's think about some day before the exercise date. Well, you know this is going to happen on the exercise date. So any day before the exercise date, the same thing should hold, except that we've got to make this the present value, present discounted value of the exercise price. Uh, and also, we have to add in, in case there is any dividends paid between now and the exercise date, plus the present discounted value of dividends paid between now and the exercise date. Because the stock gets that, and the option holders don't. Okay? So that's called the put-call parity relation. And now I can cross out exercise date. This should hold on all dates. Uh, because if it didn't hold, there would be an arbitrage uh, a profit opportunity. So um, it should hold on this page, except for minor failures to hold, uh, it should hold approximately on this page. So let me give you one example. See if it holds. Uh, let's consider the one that I can reach. <laughs> See, the strike price, okay, what is the, uh, oh, this is the stock price. So what do I have? Uh, the biggest thing here is the uh, strike price, uh, exercise price. So we want to do $25. I'll do this line, $25 plus 45 cents minus $3.60. Uh, and I'm assuming there's no dividend paid between now and May. Comes out very close to $21.85. If you, I can't do the arithmetic in my head, but it may not hold exactly because these prices may not all have been quoted at exactly the same time, and there's some transaction costs that limit this. Do you see that now? So uh, because of put-call parity relation, the Wall Street Journal didn't even need to bother to put the put prices in, <laughs> because you can get one from the other. Uh, but they do put them in, just because people like to see them. And uh, uh, they, they, uh, while some people might be trying to profit from the put-call parity arbitrage. But for our purposes, we only have to do call pricing. Once we've got call pricing, we've got put prices. 
So I just use the put call parity relation and I get put prices. So now let's think about how you would price puts. Uh, the price of a put is let's just this we know what it is on the exercise date, right? Um, I'm going to forget the dashed lines. There's no dashed lines here anymore. We're just talking about call prices. All right, so. Uh, what is the price of so that's, this shows the price of a put on the last day, of a call of a call on the last day. Now, what about an earlier day? Uh, well, the price of a call can never be negative, right? So the call price has to be above this line. Uh, it can never be worth less than the stock price minus the exercise price before the, um, even before the date. Uh, and also, it can't be worth more than the stock price itself. I'll draw a 45 degree line from the origin. So it, it, it's kind of obvious that the, that's supposed to be parallel to that. Uh, it's obvious that the call price has to be above this broken straight line, but not too far above it. Above this broken straight line representing the price as a function of the stock price on the last day. And the closer you get to the last day, the closer the options price will get to that curve. So on some day before the uh, exercise date, the option price, the call option price will probably look something like that. Right? It's, uh, it's above the broken straight line because of option value. <coughs> so think of it this way. Suppose an option is out of the money today. Uh, well, we can see out of the money options. Uh, this is an out of, for a call, this is out of the money, right? Because it, the stock price is $21.85, but I've got an option to buy it for $25. All right, that's going to be worthless unless the option price goes up before it expires. So it's only worth something because there's a chance that it will be worth something on the exercise date. And what are people paying for that chance? 45 cents. Not much. Why are they paying so little? Well, you could say intuitively it's because it's pretty far. $21.85 is pretty far from $25. And this option only has a month to go. What's the chances that the price will go up that much? Well, there is a chance, but it's not that big, so I'm only willing to pay 45 cents to buy an option like that. So we're somewhere like here on that row that I've showed you. Um, but the reason you don't want to exercise an option early is because if you exercise it early, your value drops down to the, for, down to the broken straight line. If, right, it's always worth more than the broken straight line indicates before the exercise date. So if you want to get your money out, sell the option. Don't exercise it early. So that's why the distinction between European and American options is not as big or as important as you might think at first. So we'll, we can just price European options, and uh, and then uh, we can infer what what uh, other options would be, what put options would be worth. So uh, let's um, let's now talk about pricing of options. And the main pricing equation that we're going to use is the Black-Scholes option pricing equation. But before that, I wanted to just give you a simple story of options pricing, just to give you some idea how it works. Uh, and then I'm going to not actually derive the Black-Scholes formula, but I'm going to uh, show it to you. <laughs> not, but the simple, I'm going to tell you a simple story just to give you some intuitive feel um, about pricing of options. 
And to simplify the story, I'm going to tell a story about a world in which there's only two possible prices for the underlying stock. That makes it binomial. There's only two things that can happen. Uh, and it can either be high or low. All right? So let me get my notation. I'm going to use S as the stock price. All right? Um, and then I'm going to use, I'm going to assume that the stock price, that's today's, that's today. And this is also a simple world in that there's only one day. The option expires tomorrow. <laughs> there's only one more price we're going to see. So the stock is either going to go up or down. So U is equal to 1 plus the, the fraction up that it goes up. U stands for up. And D is down, is 1 plus the fraction down. So that means that the stock price either becomes SU, which means it goes um, up by a fraction, uh, multiple U, or it is SD, which means it goes down by a multiple D. And that's all we know. Okay, but now we have a call option. Call C the price of the call. We're going to try to derive what that is. But we know um, what, from our broken straight line analysis, we know what CU is, the price if the stock goes up. And we know what CD is, it's the price if down. Okay? So, um, Suppose the option has exercise price E. All right. You understand this world? Simple story. Now, what I want to do uh, is consider a portfolio of both the stock and the option that is riskless. And I'm going to, I'm going to buy a number of options equal to um, H. H is the hedge ratio, which is the number of, number of shares sold, of shares purchased per uh, option sold. I'm going to sell a call option to hedge the stock price. To, to reduce to the risk of the stock price. Okay, and so hedge ratio is shares sold, shares purchased over options. Each option is to buy one share. Okay, so what I'm going to do is write one call and buy eight shares. So let me uh, erase this and start over again. I'm on my way to deriving the option price for you. And uh, a little bit of math, but uh, we'll get. OK. So I'm going to write one call uh, and buy eight shares. OK. If the stock goes up, if we live in an up, if we discover we're in an up world next period, my portfolio is worth U H S minus C sub U, right? Because the share price goes from S to U S, and I've got H shares, uh, and I've um, I've written a call, so I have to pay C sub U. If it's down, then it, my portfolio is D H S minus C sub D. Okay? This is simple enough? Now, what I want to do is eliminate all risk. So that means I want to choose H so that these two numbers are the same. And if I do that, I've got a riskless investment. All right? 
So uh, set these equal to each other. And that implies something about h. We can derive what h is. If I, uh, I just put these two equal to each other and solve for h, and I get h equals c sub u minus c sub d all over u minus d s. Okay. So I, I've, I've been able to put together a portfolio of the stock and the option that has zero risk. It's going to, if I do this, if I hold this amount of shares in my portfolio, I've got a riskless portfolio. So that means that the riskless portfolio has to earn the riskless rate, right? It, it, it's the same thing as a riskless rate, so it has to earn that. So if I can erase this now, I'm almost there to option pricing. The option pricing then says that um, since I've derived what H is, the, port the portfolio has to be worth 1 plus the interest rate times what I put in, which is HS minus C. Um, and uh, that has to equal the, uh, the value of the portfolio at the end, which is either U H S minus C sub U or V H S minus C sub D, the same thing. Okay. So um, I've already derived what H is, and I substituted into that, and I solve for C. So substitute H in and solve for C. And we get the call price. Okay. And it's kind of a little bit complicated, but I'll, uh, I'll write it. it. The call option price has to equal 1 plus R minus D all over U minus D times C sub U over 1 plus R plus U minus 1 minus R all over U minus D times C sub D all over 1 plus R. And I'll put a box around that because that's our option price formula. Okay? Did you follow all that? This is derived, this option price formula was derived from a no arbitrage condition. Arbitrage in finance means riskless profit opportunity. And the no arbitrage condition says it's never possible to make more than the riskless rate, risklessly. All right? If I could, suppose I had some way. Suppose the riskless rate is 5% and I can make 6% risklessly. Then I will borrow at the riskless rate and put it into the 6% opportunity, and I'll do that till kingdom come. <laughs> There's no limit to how much I'll do that. I'll do it forever. And it, so it can't, it, it's, it's, it's too much of a profit opportunity to ever happen. So the, the, one of the most powerful insights of theoretical finance is that the no arbitrage condition should hold. It's like saying there are no $10 bills on the pavement. When you walk down the street and you see a $10 bill lying there on the street, uh, you, your first thought ought to be, are my eyes deceiving me? Uh, because somebody else would have picked it up if it were there. Well, how can it be there? I once actually had that experience. I was walking down the street in New York, and I saw it was actually a $5 bill. It was just lying there on the street. And so I reached down to pick it up, and then suddenly it disappeared. And it was people on the, one of the stoops of one of these New York uh, townhouses playing a game where they had tied a string to a $5 bill <laughs> and they would leave it on the street and watch people reach for it and they'd snatch it away. The, that's the only time in my life I ever saw a $5 bill on the pavement. And so, you, you know, it sounds like a pretty good assumption that if you see one, it isn't real. And that's all this is saying, that if, if the option price didn't follow this formula, something would be wrong. 
And so it had better follow this formula. Uh, now, that is the basic core option theory. Now, the interesting thing about this theory is I didn't use the probability of up and the probability of down. So somebody said, wait a minute. My whole intuition about options is I buy an option because it might be in the money. And when I was just describing here, this is 45 cents. I said, that's not much because it probably won't. It probably won't exceed $25. It's so far below it. Uh, so it seems like the options should really be fundamentally tied to the probability of, of success. But it's not here at all. <laughs> There's no probability in it. If you saw me derive it. Was I tricking you? Well, I wasn't. I mean, I, I, I tell you, I'm not, I don't play tricks. This is absolutely right. You don't need to know the probability that it's in the money to price an option. Uh, and because you can price it out of pure no arbitrage condition. So that leads me then to the famous formula for options pricing, the Black Scholes option pricing formula, uh, which looks completely different from that, but it's a kindred because it relies on the same theory. And there it is. This was derived uh, in the late, late 70s by Fisher Black, or maybe early 70s, by Fisher Black, uh, who was at um, MIT at the time, I think, but later went to Goldman Sachs, uh, and uh, Myron Scholes, uh, who is now in San Francisco, uh, doing very well. Uh, I see him uh, at uh, I see him at our Chicago Mercantile Exchange meetings. Um, Fisher Black passed away, but uh, so uh, it doesn't have the probability that the option is in the money either. But it looks a little different. It looks totally different from the formula that I wrote over there. Um, the call price is equal to the share price, S, times uh, N of D1, where D1 is this equation, uh, minus E to the minus R, the interest rate, times time to maturity, T, times the exercise price times N of D2, where this is D2. And the N function is the cumulative normal distribution function. <laughs> all right. I'm not going to derive all that because uh, it involves what's called the calculus of variations. Uh, I don't think most of you have learned that. Uh, in, in ordinary calculus, we have what's called differentials, dy, dx, etc. Those are fixed numbers in ordinary calculus. In the mid-20th century, mathematicians, notably the Japanese mathematician Ito, developed a random version of calculus where dx and dy are random variables. That's called the stochastic calculus. But uh, I'm not going to uh, use that. I'm not going to derive this. But you can see that uh, you can see how to how to uh, price an option using Black Scholes. Uh, but Black Scholes is derived again by the no arbitrage condition, and it doesn't have the probability. Oh, the other variable that's significant here is sigma, which is the standard deviation of the change in the stock price. So and it, once we put that in, someone could say, well, but probabilities are getting in through the back door because this is really a probability-weighted sum of the changes in stock prices. Well, probabilities were not really in here at all, but uh, maybe there's something like standard deviation even in this equation because we had CU and CD, and that gives you some sense of the variability. Uh, but uh, I'm going to leave this equation just for you to look at. And, uh, but what it does do is it shows the, uh, stock, the option price as a nice curvilinear relationship, just like the one I drew by hand, uh, which then as the as time uh, to, to exercise goes down, um, as we get close to the exercise date, that uh, curve 
eventually coincides with the broken straight line. So, uh, now I wanted to tell you about implied volatility. This equation can be used either of two ways. The most normal way to do it, to use this equation, is to get the price that you think is the right price for an option, to decide whether I'm paying too much or too little for an option. Uh, so, with this formula, I can plug in all the numbers. To use this formula, I have to know what the stock price is, that's S, I have to know what the exercise price is, uh, and I have to know what the time to maturity. These are all specified by the stock price and the contract. I have to know what the interest rate is. And if I also have some idea of the standard deviation of the change in the option in, of the stock price, then I can get an option price. But I can also turn it around if I already know what the option is selling for in the market, and I can uh, infer what the implied sigma is, right? Because all the other numbers in the Black Scholes formula are clear. They're in the newspaper or they're in the option contract. There's this one hard to pin down variable. What is the variability of the stock price? And so, what people often use the Black Scholes formula to is to invert it and calculate the uh, implied volatility of stock prices. So, when call option prices are high, why is that? Why are they high relative to other times? Well, it must be that people think, I'm going back to the old interpretation that the probability of exercise is high. Right? If an out-of-the-money call is valuable, it must be people think that sigma is high. So let's actually solve for how high that is. I can't actually solve this equation. Uh, I have to do it numerically. But I can calculate for any call price, given the stock price, exercise price, time to maturity, and interest rate, I can calculate what volatility would imply uh, that stock price. And so, uh, that's where we are with uh, Black-Scholes. So, bla uh, um, implied volatility is the options market's opinion as to how variable the stock market will be between now and the exercise date. Uh, so, one thing we can do is, is compute implied volatility. Uh, and I have that here on this, on this chart here. Uh, what I have here from 1986 to the present with the blue line uh, is the VIX, uh, V-I-X, uh, which is computed now by the Chicago Board Options Exchange. When, when the CBOE was founded, they didn't know how to do this. Uh, Black and Scholes invented their equation in response to the founding of the CBOE. And now the CBOE publishes the VIX. And you get on their website, uh, that's where I got this off their website, cboe.com. Uh, and so they have computed, based on the front month uh, option, the, the, the near option, what the market thought the volatility, what the options market thought the volatility of the stock market was. That's the blue line. Uh, and you can see it had a lot of changes through time. So that means that options prices were revealing something about the volatility of the stock market. Now, the blue line is from the Chicago Board Options Exchange. What I did, and I calculated this myself, is the, the orange line is the standard deviation of actual stock prices over the preceding year. Annual, uh, of monthly changes annualized. That's actual volatility. But it's actual past volatility. So let, let's make it clear what this is. What the VIX is, is the sigma in the Black-Scholes equation. But it is, the, in, in effect, the market's expected standard deviation of stock prices. And to get it more precise, it's the standard deviation of the S&P 500 stock price index for one month multiplied by the square root of 12. 
because they want to annualize it. It's for the next month. So it's um, uh, why, do they, why do they multiply it by the square root of 12? Well, that's because, remember the square root rule. These uh, stock prices are essentially independent of each other month to month. So the standard deviation of the sum of 12 months is going to be a square root of 12 times the standard deviation of one month. So, and this is in percent per year. So that means that the implied volatility in 1986 uh, was uh, 20%. And then it shot way up to 60 percent, unimaginably. In fact, <laughs> that might be the record high. I can't quite tell from here. Uh, remember, I told you the story of the 1987 stock market crash. The stock market fell over 22 percent in one day. Well, actually, on the S&P, it was only 20 percent, but a lot in one day. It really spooked the options markets. So the call option prices went way up, thinking that. There's some big volatility here. We don't know which way it'll be next. Maybe it'll be up, maybe it'll be down. It pushed the, um, the, op the implied volatility temporarily up to a huge level. It came right back down. My actual volatility, now this is, I calculated this for each date as the volatility of the market over the preceding year. Well, since I put October 1987 in my formula, <coughs> I got a jump up in actual volatility but not as all as big as the options market did. So the option market is looking ahead. And I, I have no way to look ahead other than to look at the options market. Uh, so what I, to get my actual volatility, I was obliged to look at volatility in the past. And uh, it went up because of the 1987 volatility, but not so much. So what this means is that <coughs> in 1987, People really panicked. They thought something is really going on in the stock market. They didn't know what it was, and they were really worried. And that's why we see this spike in implied volatility. Uh, there's a couple other spikes that I've noted. The Asian financial crisis occurred in the mid, mid 1990s. And now, that is something that was primarily Asian, uh, but it got people anxious over here as well. It was, you know, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Indonesia, uh, Hong Kong, these, these countries had huge turmoil. But it came over here in the form of a sudden spike in expected volatility. People thought things could really happen here. So all the option prices got more valuable. Um, and then there's this spike. <laughs> this is the one that you remember. This is the fin financial crisis that occurred in the last few years. Notably, it peaks in the fall of 2008, which was the real crisis when Lehman Brothers collapsed, and it created a crisis all over the world. Uh, there was a sharp and sudden, terrible event. Uh, and you can see that actual volatility shot up to uh, the highest since 1986 as well at that time. So implied volatility, uh, you know, I, you can't ask easily from this chart whether it was right or wrong. People were responding to information, and they, the response felt its way into options prices. Uh, what actually, I, there's no way to find out ex post whether they were right to be worried about that, but they were worried about, uh, about uh, these events, and it led, to, um, it led to big jumps in options prices. Now, I wanted to show the same chart going back even further, uh, but I can't do it with options prices because I can show volatility earlier, but I can't show implied volatility before around 1986 because the options markets weren't developed yet. But I computed an actual uh, S&P composite volatility. Well, in my chart title, I said S&P 500. The Standard & Poor 500 stock price index technically starts in 1957. But I've got uh, the, what they call the Standard & Poor composite back to um, 1871. And so these are the actual um, moving standard deviations of, the, of stock prices. Uh, 
all the way back to the beginnings of uh, the stock market in the U.S. Well, not the very beginnings, but the earliest that we can get consistent data for uh, on a monthly basis. Uh, and you can see this goes back further than the other chart. Um, you can see that the actual volatility of stock prices has been, except for one big event <laughs> called the Great Depression uh, of the 1930s, has been remarkably stable. Right? The the volatility in the late 20th century, early 21st century, is just about exactly the same as the volatility in the 19th century. It's interesting how stable these uh, patterns are. There was this one really anomalous event, and it just sticks out, uh, and that is the Great Depression. 1929 precedes it. It's somewhere in here. But uh, somehow people got really rattled by the 1929 stock market crash. And uh, not just in the U.S. This is U.S. data, but you'll find this all over the world. Uh, it led to a full decade of tremendous stock market volatility uh, uh, around the world that has never been repeated since. The recent financial crisis has the uh, second highest volatility after the Great Depression. This isn't long ago. <laughs> this is with, right. This is well within your memories. It's just uh, uh, a couple, a few years ago, uh, we had another huge impact on volatility, uh, and as you saw in the preceding slide, it had a big impact on implied volatility as well. Uh, so I think that we had a near miss of another depression. It's uh, really scary what happened in this crisis. Uh, what I have also shown here is the first oil crisis, which we talked about in 1974, uh, when oil prices they had been locked into a, a pattern because of the stabilization done by the Texas Railroad Commission. But when that broke, when OPEC first ex flexed its muscles. It created a sense of new reality, uh, and it caused fear, and it caused a, a big spike up in, in volatility of the stock market, but uh, not quite as big as the current financial crisis. So, I think this is an interesting chart to me, because it shows that financial markets. Well, a lot of things that I learned from this chart, and maybe I'll just uh, conclude with some thoughts about this. But what I learned from this chart is that. Somehow, financial markets are very stable for a long time. So it would seem like it wouldn't be that much of an extrapolation. When are you people going to retire? You, you've picked a retirement date yet? <laughs> well, let's say a half century from now, OK? So that would be 2060, uh, something like that. So you're, you're going to retire out here, all right? Your whole life is in here. What do you think volatility is going to do? Over that whole period, well, just judging from the plot, it's probably pretty similar, right? I mean, that, that's not much more history compared to what we've already seen. Probably just going to keep doing this, but there's this risk of something like this happening again, uh, and we saw a near miss here, um, but we didn't. Uh, I think this this plot encourages me to think uh, that maybe outliers or Fat tails or black swan events uh, are the big disruptor to economic theory. Black shoals uh, is not a black swan theory. It, it assumes normality of distributions. And so it's not always reliable. Uh, um, so uh, this leads me to think that uh, option pricing theory, I, I've presented a theory, uh, the Black-Scholes theory is very elegant and a very useful tool, especially useful when things behave normally. <coughs> but I think one always has to keep in the back of one mind the risk of sudden major changes like we've seen here. Uh, so let me just give a, some final thoughts about um, Options. I, I, I launched this lecture by saying they're very important, uh, and uh, they 
uh, they, uh, they affect our lives in many ways. I've been trying to campaign for the expansion of our financial markets. Uh, I, I, working with my colleagues um, and the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, we launched options in 2006 on single-family homes in the United States. Uh, we were hoping that people would buy put options to protect themselves against home price declines, but the uh, uh, market never took off. Um, we have since seen huge human suffering because of the failure of people to protect themselves against home price declines. Um, there were things, noise, various noises that were made by um, people in power that suggested that maybe something could be done. Uh, President Obama proposed something called Home Price Protection Program, and it sounded like an option, a put option program, but actually it was a much more subtle program than that. It was a, a program to incentivize mortgage originators to do workouts on mortgages if the mortgages uh, would de default, or if, if home prices were to fall, and nothing really happened with it. The president can't get things started either, <laughs> always. Um, I've been proposing that mortgages should have put options on the house attached to them. When you buy a house, get a mortgage, you should automatically get a put option. I've, I've got a new paper on that. But these are kind of futuristic things at the moment. Uh, but my sense, I'm just saying this at the end just to try to impress on you what I think is the real importance of, of options markets. Uh, people don't manage risks well in the present world. Having options or insurance-like contracts of an expanded nature uh, will help people manage their risks better, and it will uh, make for a better world. Okay, that's, uh, I, I'll, I'll see you on Monday.